On today's Hobbies, Crafts and Collectibles, we'll be talking to a man who plays with fire and turns it into art. You're going to want to see some of his beautiful work, so stay tuned for that. Then later on in the show, I want to show you something that I collect, kind of a colorful jewelry collection. I know there are a lot of jewelry collectors out there, and I'm going to show you some ways that you might not have thought of before to display them, so stay tuned. It's my pleasure to welcome Tim Boyce from Charleston to our studio today. Tim, thank you so much for coming oh, in. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited we get to play a little bit today. I've never met somebody who plays with fire and gets away with it, so I'm kind of excited. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I haven't burned anything up up yet. So, but there good. was an incident, and we'll talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Tim has well, he's an artist, and so when you're an artist, sometimes you have your I call it having your thumb in more than one pie. Mm -hmm. And so you paint using a very unique technique, but then you also um, kind of upcycle uh, toys. So we're going to talk about both of those today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is something new to me on both levels. So I'm excited okay. about that. Yeah. I love to learn about new hobbies and that's why we do this show. Um, first of all, let's do the painting first. Okay. Um, now, we aren't allowed to set a flame <laughs> in the studio, so we can't really show a demonstration, but we are gonna show some footage here in a little bit of you doing this technique. But you actually use flame and a paintbrush to create art on glass. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's just, well, first of all, so you can see what I'm talking about. Behind us, we have a beautiful um, work of art. It's a tree. Um, well, uh, well, technically, it's the burning bush. It's so. the burning yeah. bush. Okay, from, yeah. gotcha, from yeah. the story of Moses. So mm -hmm. we've got the burning bush. Now, what's interesting about this is you work backwards. Not only yes. are you painting uh -huh. an image, but I've always been fascinated. That's kind of an old craft, too. Mm -hmm the reverse painting, is that what, what you call well, it? Or what well, you... technically in like in art class, one of the things you'll learn if you do landscaping or anything is you, you work from the back and come to the front. Okay. So you, you want to think about what, if it's a detail piece or a piece of detail, that's one of the last things you want to do. Gotcha. So you have to think in reverse. And also uh, one of the things I do uh, is I do some graffiti as well. And so in doing graffiti, you have to think from the back to the front. And so, so with this, you're, you're thinking from the back to the front, but doing so with a mirror image. Gotcha. Now, are you using what kind of paints are you using? In uh, this just process? standard acrylics. Uh, anything. Uh, it's water based. So, since I'm using fire, I'm using accelerant to set the brush on fire, and then I, I've got paint mixed in with it. And if I use an oil base, then it would just keep burning. Uh, it would it would eventually just burn itself <laughs> up, and there wouldn't be anything left of it. And so, one of the challenges is making sure that 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 paint that's on the brush doesn't dry out and then when it does dry out you have to uh, you have to rub it off or get it off and I see it clumps up so doing a lot of detail work with while you're painting with fire is kind of hard to do mm -hmm. uh, so one, one, one of the things and one of the challenges with that so that was the first one I did and was realizing that if I wanted to do something that looked like I had a lot of detail to have to do it, uh, a larger scale okay so let's so. lay the groundwork for this you you majored in art in yes. college mm -hmm. Did you attend here at Eastern, or where did you Georgetown attend? College in Kentucky. Okay. Now, was this something you learned in college, this technique, or is this something that you kind of were inspired I, to do? I was at a conference, and there was a sword swallower there named Dan Meyer. And Dan also, uh, he's he's been in the Guinness Book. He, he's done several things, but I, I met him, and he swall he, he he's a fire eater and sword swallower. He does both. And well, I, I was just talking to him, and I, I said, so, you know, everybody's ever painted with fire. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was just something that ran, you know, ran through my mind. I like playing, playing with fire anyway. Everybody likes playing with fire <laughs> that I know of. I haven't met too many people that don't. Uh, and so, and, I, and I've, I've painted in front of people before as far as a performance-based thing. And so I was just, eh, why not try it? Sure. And so I just kind of like started pittering and puttering through d different ways to accomplish it and get it, get it done. I see. So, um, like I said, we we're going to so, show some footage, but kind of describe the process. Well, what kind of brush would you use that you could actually set on fire? <laughs> an, an old one. <laughs> an old one. <laughs> uh, yeah, any, any kind of brush will work. The, the idea, it's the same, same as a uh, wick inside of your candle. Okay. Uh, you're, you're putting an accelerant on it. Uh, lighter fluid works best. You don't want to use anything that's more volatile than that. Then you might cause an explosion. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll have an open bowl of, of whatever the accelerant might be dip the brush in it and so what's burning off is the actual light you know the lighter fluid itself i see so it would be the same how basic, long does that take same basic concept of you you could actually put your hand in it and set your hand on fire as long as you put it out quick enough sure uh, but eventually the brush does begin to burn 
So it's, and it varies depending on the size of the brush. I see. So the, the idea is to allow the accelerant to burn and yeah, and, and paint, not and paint while it's burning. <laughs> destroy your brush. I well, it does destroy the brush. It does. You, you lose the brush. Yeah, eventually. So, I mean, and, I, and, it. and I've got enough old brushes around that I'm, <laughs> I'm able to cycle through them. Understood. Understood. Okay, so um, you've got the brush on fire. Kind of walk me through as far as like timing. I see. I'm trying to picture this in my mind. I know we'll see the footage of it, but. But how, how long does this process take? Like how long would it have taken you to paint this tree? That painting was done in uh, uh, about 45 minutes. Really? Yeah. Wow. And you're able to layer the paint because it, does it dry quickly? Well, yes it does. Uh, acrylics dry fast anyway. That's okay. one of the uh, advantages of using acrylics. Uh, about the only time acrylics don't dry, I've uh, done painting on Christmas on the Square. Mm -hmm. I've done kind of like a, one of the open window scenes and it was 40 degrees and misting and so nothing dried. <laughs> uh, but, but when you have fire, it dries. Uh, which <laughs> makes just makes sense. But also, with the, if you'll notice on the glass, the uh, the glass gives you an opportunity to work from your put your background on the glass and then mm -hmm. flip it over to the other side. And while while one side is drying, you're painting the other side. I see. That's the way that works because I can see the texture on this side and see te you get such a unique effect. Now, mm -hmm. what effect does the fire have on it as opposed to just a normal acrylic painting? What? It makes it clump. Makes it clump. <laughs> yeah, you get it, unique it, texture that yeah, way. Yeah, you get you? you'll get a lot of a lot of texture that way, but you have to move fast. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> speed, speed is one of the, one of the keys. And you probably have one of those personalities. You're probably a Type A. Well, I, I, I paint I paint quicker than, than the average person, but as far as like a lot of performance painters will paint a lot faster than I will. Understood. Understood. Now there was an incident. Sure. You yeah, were, it you, was at the. <laughs> um, I think it was at the. We we had a student uh, volunteer fair where you set up tables and stuff. We had a oh. table set up and I was painting and I guess it was a windy day or something and we had a, ha, had one of our uh, students was with us manning the table watched it all happen but didn't help but the um, <laughs> and I, I was painting name, what? No, don't. and uh, I, I noticed fire you know right around my knee which is not supposed to be there it's supposed to be up here so I was painting <laughs> and I looked down and there was fire around my drop drop cloth oh. and then like a little three by five foot section of the quad was on fire as well oh. so it was a student information fair you know about volunteer service and i, I had the small fire that was about this high so yours was quad. an example of how to yeah and, and i had i had stuff there to like you know just basically you know, put it out like like an indian squaw with a blanket and put it out you had but the, i asked the student to help me and it's yeah. like oh can you help me put it out and the bowl of accelerant was on fire and so to help he decided he was going to blow that out, and so he put his face right over top of it and blew down and lost his eyebrows. Oh my! Yes, yes. <laughs> so it became a double demonstration. Yeah, how it, to, it, it, yeah. It was what not to do and how to yeah. put out a fire, mm -hmm. and how to paint with fire. <laughs> yeah, and, and make sure there's no wind. So yeah. It's... So this is not something you take, you know, lightly. You need to have a good space. Mm -hmm. If somebody's going to try this, they don't want to probably do it in a unventilated, tight, yeah, with lots don't... of paper in it. <laughs> Yeah, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> that kind of space would not be good. Now, I want to show this piece. This is interesting. What was your inspiration for this? Uh, that was uh, shortly after the earthquakes that mm -hmm. hit Haiti. And so I did uh, did that piece there. It's called We're Still Here, uh, mm -hmm. Be Our Hope. And so it's just to illustrate that there are lots of, lots of children out there. And, and one of the things you'll notice in that uh, kind of takes into uh, some of my art background. It, I love to skew space and manipulate space, which mm. is which the glass helps to do a lot of. Uh, so within that within that piece, I, I have painting, you know, have stuff on either side of the glass, mm -hmm. but also I have multiple uh, vanishing points or uh, focal points mm -hmm. within that piece that uh, make the space just kind of like move in different di different ways. And just to let you know that things are skewed, so the world you live in would be skewed, but still again, mm. there's a sense of hope, and then there's also a, a also, just really a sense of human obligation to help those who are in need. Absolutely. Um, so if you see it, you you know you you have to go out and to and to do something. Sure, I love this piece because there is a depth to it. Mm -hmm. um, the the person sitting here, you can. I don't know if the camera's going to pick up on that, but you can see that there is actually like a, a three quarter inch gap between the mm -hmm. glass and yeah. what's behind it. It's and so really so beautiful. so as you walk around the figure, then you. The, the shadow actually moves. Yeah, which is mm. fascinating. I love that part of it. And, 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 and then we outline. did the standard portrait uh, painter technique to where the eyes are going to follow you as well. Ah, gotcha. To make sure that you're drawn into it. Right. And you, you've actually outlined, is this a paint that you've used to outline? No, that's a that Sharpie. A, that is, yeah. that's what I wonder because yeah. that's great that you're mixing your media and it's it's got a neat effect. It's mm -hmm. really beautiful. Um, 
Now, you would call yourself an expressionist, is that right? Expressionist, <laughs> impressionist, surrealist, kind of all squished together. And for non-art people, what mm -hmm. is that? Uh, really, what, what's the idea is you want to express yourself with color. So mm -hmm. my, when, I, when I paint something, I want to think about how you're feeling. I want to think about what you're thinking as opposed to what you would actually look like. So if I did a portrait of you, mm -hmm. Your face, as your face, necessarily wouldn't be too important, or the lines that construct your face may not necessarily be important. Mm -hmm. So I would want to draw what you're thinking or how you're thinking. I uh, kind of give you a, a psychological profile to a degree, and I'll do that with color. Okay. So I'll, I'll what you, color would I be? I'm just wondering. You know, you've met me know. for like just a little while here. I don't think like that. I, I just typically, <laughs> I just, I just typically grab the brush and just go with it. Uh, Understood. Sometimes like that, there's a lot of form involved. So um, obviously, I use a lot more form, but the main thing I, I want to do emotively there is color. So if you notice some of the colors there in the background of that, you'll see a lot of yellows, grays, mm -hmm. uh, some of the blues, kind of a melancholy type of feel to it. And so you're using the color more so than you are the lines or the mm -hmm. forms. And use it, and, and that color it, then you're using to express yourself mm -hmm. or to bring a point across. And I love that about art. It's not just about the face value of what the picture is. You've mm -hmm. got excuse the pun, multiple layers yeah. <laughs> of meaning based upon color, form, mm -hmm. everything. So, oh, I love that. Okay, now we're going to fast forward to the future <laughs> and, uh, because this is, this is a very trendy thing right now. Um, a lot of people have heard of steampunking where you're taking, uh -huh. you're taking bits and baubles um, of metal or whatever and you're creating something. But now this has a very um, unique this is a very specific uh, form of type of steam steampunking. It's called kit bashing. Is that right? Well, yeah. Well, it's it's all, kit bashing is taking toys, um, whether it be Transformers, GI Joes, something that I would have had as a kid. Mm -hmm. And since now I'm I'm an old geek, and a lot of old <laughs> geeks have money. They spend their money on these things. But the but for me, it's 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 a natural transition. Being an artist, I built models as a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, ran across it just looking up some of my old toys to, to find out what the value was. And I found there was this customization uh, market and just hobby that was out there. And so a, a lot of the customizers they they call it kit bashing, but you're you're taking a toy that's there. Um, some of your Japanese toys, like your Gundams, you'll have a Gundam model kit. So it's mm -hmm. You know, a Japanese youngster would, wouldn't open his toy out of the package and begin playing with it. He would put it together first and then customize it, order different fists and different things for it. So it's taking an existing toy and uh, doing something with it. And so I've got, got one example out there that's finished. Yeah. Uh, it's and not I'll, steampunk. Let me show the before first. Yeah. Now this would be um, yeah. like you're talking about a toy kit. Yeah, that, that that, that's just together. a standard toy. That's a <clears throat> standard Transformers toy. Yeah. That's Ravage. And so Ravage, this is what he would look like. But no, we're not going to be content with that. We're going to have all. fun with it. <laughs> yeah. and this is what you've done. This is amazing. Yeah, so uh, the, <laughs> in, in the movie, if you, if you watch the movie, that character is ripped in half. And so the idea with this one is that he, he, he just basically reconstructed himself from parts on the battlefield. And then also the, the original toy had some really anemic wings that were kind of inside. And so I built some wings and put those wings on, on it. I see. Look at the wings on this one. So that the, is so neat. And then you've actually painted the whole thing out and yeah. really so had some fun with him. <laughs> give, give the idea that he's he's been through the battlefield and yeah. it's been chewed up. I love that. And so you do this as a hobby for fun, but mm -hmm. then you also um, have found an outlet to sell online as well. Yeah, there, there's several places, uh, there's several online communities that mm -hmm. uh, you can get commissions to customize certain things. Mm -hmm. There's uh, all the time... One of the most common is it, like if you pick up a toy at the store and it doesn't look like the toy either in the cartoon or the movie, they want it to look exactly like the toy in, mm. within the movie. Gotcha. Or they want something done different to it. Mm -hmm. And so with, within a, a franchise like Transformers, you're talking about something that goes all the way back into the early 80s. And so there have been many iterations of several characters. And so they may want the head from the character from 1992. I see. As, so they can really as, 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 opposed to, as opposed to the head of the character that's, that's mm -hmm. on it presently. And so it may be something as simple as taking something like this, where you'd have like a ball joint. Uh, this this okay. is one of the tools of the trade. Okay. Um, you. I see. So those those are uh, that's those are some ball joints that you can get, and that's what the wings are attached with. I and see. so that that enables enables you to get there's some articulation. The, the ball part of it, and then there's the the mm -hmm. other part that yeah. would fit into. Understood. So yeah. so using various parts, but then you also actually 
can create your own parts, which yes. I think I mm -hmm. find fascinating. I, I want to look at some of your examples here. First of all, explain what these, this epoxy is. Okay, and that's, that's a two-part epoxy uh, called epoxy sculpt. And you just get two parts of that, and okay. it works a lot like a plasticine clay. <laughs> so you, you can shape it and form it into anything you want. Uh, the one head out there is made out of a epoxy sculpt. And it, it's a tool that you can use. You can use it to actually make your own parts. Uh, that head you've got right there is not completely finished, so okay. we'll, we'll, we'll do some more work on it. Uh, it sets up hard like yeah. plastic, and uh, it's used in various industries. It's used in taxidermy, uh, special effects, sure. floors to use it. Uh, and so are there various, you've got um, various beings down here. I'm going to let the camera zoom in on these. Yeah. So are, the, are these like um, different stages of... Well, those are just different uh, head ideas sure. for, the, uh, for steampunking the, the one toy, the jet that's right there. Ah. So the, the, the first one you see there closest to the jet is the uh, factory head. And come like that. Yeah. And this is the guy, the pilot of the... Well, that's, that's the actual robot itself. So oh, okay. So if you... Oh, I see. So this transforms, of course. Yeah, he'll transform <laughs> into a robot. Understood. Uh, and uh, his name is Sky Warp, and we're going to transform him in, in, into a Time Warp character because <laughs> nice. he's going to be steampunked. Uh, you see the... Yeah, I want to show. Now, he would have come with this wing. Yeah, that's okay, one of his wings. These are two of his wings here. I'm yeah, so part, part of the background. procedure when, when you're customizing, you, have, you deconstruct the toy. So mm -hmm. if there's screws in it, you take the screws out, you, take, you pop the pins out, you sand it down, and uh, then you'll paint it gotcha. uh, with a primer. And those are going to be the... Uh, this is the new wing. So yeah. the old wing. Old, here, old I'll hold it out here. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stretch cloth across that. Sure. Uh, probably an old shop rag. Oh, what a great idea. So, yeah, because you're looking at something with a kind of a, I'm going for like an old worn cloth wing. And so the, I'll the use joint a, here is that epoxy you were yeah. talking mm -hmm. about, right? So you've made this little joint. So I've made that and then I'll, I'll go back in and to finish that out, I'll, I'll make it look like it has rivets in it. Oh, neat. So that would that would finished product. That would be the that that would be the order or No, that's just an idea I had. Okay. So it was like Yeah. I think I want to do that. Yeah. But you can pick uh, pick pieces parts anywhere. The joints on that come from uh, Lego Bionicles or just uh, mm -hmm. any kind of like building set that has uh, joints in it. You can pull those out. Sure. A lot of guys will cut toys apart. Okay. So if if you find a piece that you like, you can just pull it off of anything. Uh, the eyes there uh, come from gears from like a science kit, and then they're lock tooth washers okay. as well. Anything that looks like anything you might want to use, you can pull it apart and use it. Nice. It's perfectly legal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Now, yeah. you also have, I, I definitely want to get to Dan over here yeah. before mm -hmm. we go. We have a local um, business owner here in town. We've actually had him on the show because he paints, mm -hmm. um, but you are creating his figure. I love, I, I hope we can pick up some of this. I'm just going to pick up the head here. Yeah. But, um, but you, again, the ball, what do you call these again? It's the ball joint. Ball yeah. joints that yeah. you've embedded in the, in the epoxy. You can see the joint there. But here's this. I wish we could go back. Maybe we'll try to go back and get a, a shot of this guy so we can see what he looks like. But that looks just like him. Did he ask you to make this? Or this no, that, that was an idea I had uh, <laughs> a, few, a few years back. I, made, I turned him into a, uh, a superhero. I love for, that. Uh, for his business. I called him the Jackman. The and, Jackman. Uh, <laughs> That is little so mini comic great. strip, and, and and so it was an idea that they all, it was just around. It's like, ah, I'm just gonna make a Dan for fun, and so I, so that's that's the Dan in process. Uh, that's that's a plasticine version, and so what I'll, what I'll do with that. Uh, so if it's in clay, then I'll go back in and I'll I'll cast it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's compounds that you can get. There's various things. There's silicone based compounds, any uh, various ca compounds that would be uh, flexible. Okay. So what you'll do is it's, it's just basic casting and sculpture. You'll set it up to where you can pour into it, and but you'll cast that around it, and eventually what'll happen is you'll lose your uh, your little plasticine or your your clay figure. That'll pr that'll pretty much be destroyed by by the silicone. Sometimes it depends on which compound you use as, as to how. But if you if you're using clay, what it looks like is what it's going to look like, but it also gives you great detail, sure. uh, and then you can reproduce it. But if it's a one-time shot thing, then uh, you can just use the the epoxy sculpt, mm -hmm. which acts a lot like clay. Uh, not, not exactly. It, it takes. It, there's a learning curve to it uh, because it's 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 a little bit squishier and, and a little bit different. And the, and the surface is oh, is see. different than clay. But once you get used to it, it's it's pretty simple to to work with. Now, when you finish these off, you use just a modeling paint, like you would. Yes. Uh, there, there's several different painting methods you could use. Uh, 
there you you have like your standard model paints that you can use uh but also airbrushing works works best oh okay if if you can airbrush it airbrush it mm -hmm. that, that'll give you a nice clean surface uh however for what i'm going with i may i'll probably put a, a primary coat down that'll be airbrushed so if you look at the uh the ravage figure over there mm -hmm. he has a primary coat that's on him that's one color sure and then we've gone back through and dry brushed I don't know if you're familiar with dry brushing technique. Dry brushing just, just basically means you, you get a little bit of paint on the brush, not too much. Uh, a lot of people, if they get too much paint, you'll just put it on a paper towel where you have very little and you just swipe the brush across and it gives you kind of a weathered look. Uh, you, you can do the ah. same thing with furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's used for various things and, and people who, anti who antique furniture do that a lot. Right. Uh, but for your toys, if, if you notice, he, he has a lot of dry brushing on him. Uh, He's got a really cool finish, for yeah. sure. And so it it it, get, it, give, it gives you a nice weathered look. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. Like you said, he's been through the battle. <laughs> yeah, so, so with this one, uh, like that one, I'll cut back into it. Uh, sure. Put a lot of cuts and grooves, blast marks, and various things in it. Gotcha. To make it look like it's a little more weathered, as opposed, as opposed to a polished look. If you're going for sure. a polished look, then what you'll do is you'll tape it or mask it off and then airbrush it. Well... I love the technique. I love everything that you've brought. You've given us a lot to consider as far as those of us who are shopping for hobbies. And we do appreciate you bringing your work into this studio today, yeah. Tim. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. On today's show and tell segment, I thought it might be fun to talk about hankies and aprons. Now, these are items that I know a lot of you have. A lot of you collect them either because your family passed them down. You might have your mothers, your grandmothers like me. Actually, one of the very first things I ever started collecting was because my grandmother unfortunately passed on and I inherited two of her aprons, which I wanted to show to you. I love aprons. A lot of them had they were made out of things that people had around and you know in the old days you'd have flour and feed sacks made out of cloth that you could actually reuse and this is my grandmother's um, old feed sack apron but then they also had really interesting fluffy ones and I used to think what on earth who how could this ever be a utilitarian item that somebody could actually benefit from but these were their hostess aprons in the good old days when you entertained and people came over you still wore an apron to protect your pretty dress but you wanted people to be able to see the pretty dress so it was a little bit sheer and this is my grandmother's hostess apron so I thought it might be neat since I know a lot of you have these type of items to show you uh, kind of an idea on how you might display and use your hankies and aprons rather than just stick them in a drawer somewhere and, and hoping the moths don't get them, why not actually display them? So I wanted to show you kind of a neat window treatment. First of all, look at the hankies that you can find. Now you can find these for a quarter at garage sales. You can find more collectible ones. But the great thing about this is um, this project, you're not going to actually hurt the, the uh, hanky or the aprons at all. And so you can display some of them some of the time, switch them out really easily. And I love that about this project. So first of all, I wanted to show you um, this idea for a valance. Now this is going to go across the top of your window. And what I've done is just taken an old curtain rod. I actually stole this off my back door. I live in this big old house and it has this great um, back door that has, had a curtain rod that I never used. So I thought it might be perfect for this project. Um, and what I've done is just selected some of the most colorful hankies that I have in my collection. Plus, I tend to hoard <laughs> um, clip earrings. Surely you've seen these at sales and you can pick them up again very inexpensively. Um, but they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Rhinestones, this is a milk glass one, pearl button. Um, all different kinds, and clip earrings are a great way to accessorize this valance, again, with no sewing and certainly no marring of your hankies. So let me show you real quick how this works. Okay, um, again, here I have my curtain rod. Now this one, I'll show you ex exactly how that hangs here in just a moment. But what you're gonna need is either some ribbon or what I picked up were some little girl because I like pink. Again, that's kind of a nod to my grandma. Her favorite color was pink. And so I picked up these little ponytail holders because um, I thought that would be a really easy way of putting these on. Now let me show you um, how this works. So easy. Um, you're gonna take the ponytail holder and the clip earring and just stick it up in there as far as it'll go. Any curtain rod will do, any size. It just depends on what look you're going for. Take the uh, ponytail holder around the little curtain rod and just clip it in. And there you have automatically 
the top of your treatment. Now what you're going to do is take your hanky, whichever one you choose, and what I like to do is hold the middle of it and then just fluff it and see how you can get it to hang and just make sure it's got the look that you want and you're just going to clip it right on there. Easy, breezy. Now if you wanted to do something a little bit cuter, maybe for a little girl's room or something, or something a little bit more romantic, you could just tie some circles with ribbon, have the same effect, put it over your curtain rod, like so, and then you can leave your little, your ends hanging, so there's a thought, but let me just show you how this connects. This is so, I just lost one, but that's okay, didn't need it anyway. <laughs> this um, it's one of those great rods that you can just stick right on. Now you can use a tension rod or any kind of curtain rod is going to do. And you can put as many on as you want. Just depends on what look you're going for. And then I thought taking a couple of ordinary cup hooks, I thought it might be cool. And I actually had a matching set of pink aprons. Just to attach the, the uh, cup hooks to the side of the window. Just tie a knot and hook it on. And then the uh, middle section here, I've just, whoops, I've just tied the little apron strings together and you have an adorable window treatment and a great way to display your collection. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll use it.